Brent here from American English with this guy. And I want to thank you. There are a lot of good English teachers here on YouTube and you chose to watch one of my videos. And as a thank you, I have over two hours of English lessons for you with no ads. So all you have to do, push play, maybe put in those AirPods or those headphones, whatever you want to call them, and listen to English for two hours. We're going to visit an American post office. We'll visit a river, learn English vocabulary about water, English homophones, and of course, you know some English phrasal verbs will be in the mix. What I've done is I've taken older videos that were on the channel, deleted them, put them here without ads. I mean, how can your English not improve after two hours of listening? So maybe you're going to sleep. Maybe you can listen while you sleep and learn English. Maybe you can listen while you work out. Maybe you can listen while you do dishes. Two hours. Your English will definitely get better. Thank you so much for watching. Enjoy the two hours, and if you don't mind, hit that like button. Thanks so much. Hello, and welcome back to another video. Today's video is going to be all about rivers. Prepositions with rivers, idioms with rivers, vocabulary with rivers. I know this isn't going to be a mini lesson. I just don't know if it's going to be a medium lesson or a mega lesson. But before we get started with the lesson, I just want to thank you all for tuning in, showing your support for the channel. We're at almost 1500 subscribers and that's all because of you. So thank you so much. All right, can you see that in the distance? It's small, but we would call that a waterfall, a small one, but definitely water is falling, it's a waterfall. Often in the spring, when the snow is melting in the mountains, this is a pretty dangerous place to stand. But we haven't had rain in quite a while, so I am in absolutely no danger here, as you can see. Behind me is a bridge that goes over the river, but this is a special kind of bridge because a train could travel on that bridge and that type of bridge is something we call a trussle. And that bridge behind me, where the cars are going over, we just call that a bridge. And in a minute, we will be going under that bridge. Maybe I'll come back later in the year when the river is more impressive. It's the uh, Androscoggin River. And these subtitles will be accurate. Pretty tough word to say and spell but it comes from a Native American term. So Androscoggin, sometimes shortened to the Andro or the mighty Androscoggin. And the place we were just at is called Lewiston Falls, but nothing's really falling there right now. The river has been known to flood where the water actually reaches the top of that bridge and sometimes crests over that bridge. The last major flood we had was probably a time before you were even born, 1987. Did you notice that verb I just used, crest? It's often used when we talk about floods, and that is when the river reaches its highest level. The river may crest over the bridge. And right near the river is a really old house, 1796. And I'm sure some of you who don't live in the United States are asking, 1796? That's not old. But for us in the US, it's about as old as our country. So yeah, it's pretty old for us. So let's talk a little bit about prepositions. Right now, I am walking along the riverbank. And even though there is a, a fence here, 
the river is still right there down below. So I am walking along the river bank. I'm not going to hop over this fence to get into the water. I'm going to keep walking along the river bank. Notice I said river bank. That is often what we call the edge of the water in the land when a river is involved. If it was the ocean, we might call it a shore. So you often hear the river's bank or the ocean's shore, but both are where the water and the land meet. Did you see that tiny little place where the water is flowing? That's a good verb to know when we talk about water flowing. And we could also say the water is flowing over the falls. Here's a little plaque about the history of the Great Falls. And notice it's written in both English and in French. And that word geology, that means the study of the earth. Anytime you see geo in English, think of earth. Geology, studying earth like rocks and minerals. Geography, graph means writing. So geography is the study of maps, drawing parts of the earth. So the name Androscoggin originally comes from a Wabanaki word. And the Wabanakis are the Native Americans who were here before the Europeans came in. And I messed this up when I filmed it, but dusk is sunset and dawn is sunrise. So in just a minute, we will be walking under the bridge while cars are driving over the bridge. So now we are under the bridge and I'm wondering if you've ever heard the saying water under the bridge. That basically means there was some sort of drama, some sort of hardship, some sort of pain, but it's now all forgotten. Let's say that you had an argument with your friend, but you made up. You're no longer fighting. You can say, ah, it's all water under the bridge. So there are some ducks right where I want to go. They may fly off, but I have an idiom with ducks. So far they haven't moved. They're probably used to people. I wonder how many people try to feed them. So most of them didn't like me that much, but those two stuck around. I'm not going to jump in the water, but that would be the preposition we would use if I were to go into the water. But now that I am at the riverbank, let's talk about that idiom with ducks. And the idiom is like water off a duck's back. And if you know anything about ducks, they're quite oily and the water just rolls off their back. That's what we say when something doesn't bother us. Maybe you're talking to one of your friends about that argument you got into with another friend. They may say, were you bothered by it? You could say, no, it's like water off a duck's back. Didn't really bother me. So we've talked about how this is the river bank, but if you go into the bottom of the river, that's called the river bed. We've talked about some Latin and Greek roots already. Geo meaning earth, graph meaning right. But the Latin and Greek root for water is actually hydro. And this river is used to generate electricity in some parts of the state. We call that electricity hydroelectricity. Some people put their boats in this river and what I'm standing on is called a boat launch. People drive their cars with their boats on their trailers down to the riverbank and will put their boat in the river. And when the canoe or the boat is actually on the river, 
we change the preposition. We might say they are sailing downstream. So the river is flowing that way. If the boat was flowing downstream, it would be going this way with the current. The current is the way the river flows. If it was fighting the current, we would say that it is going upstream. So to review, just to make sure I'm clear, if a boat is flowing downstream, it's flowing with the current. If it's trying to go against the current, it's going upstream. And of course, if it's going upstream, you would have to paddle or maybe you have a motor on your boat. And sometimes this river does have a strong current. When the water is going quickly, we sometimes use the word swift. Uneven shoreline? That means it's not flat. Supervise your children at all times. Super is another Latin and Greek root meaning above. So supervise your children, watch out for them. A superior is someone who we might call a boss or a supervisor. Unfortunately, this river is actually polluted, meaning it's kind of dangerous, the water in it. They suggest, experts suggest, that you eat only one fish from this river each month. Needless to say, I don't eat any fish from this river. I don't wanna take any chances. I hope you're enjoying this lesson. I think it's starting to turn into a mega lesson, but if you have stuck with me this far, thank you so much. Hope you're learning a lot. Maybe you will have to watch this a couple times to get everything as a loud truck goes over. But if you are enjoying, please think about subscribing to this channel if you haven't already. Yeah, definitely a mega lesson. As I look through my notes, I still have quite a few more things to say. Remember, if you are having difficulty, all of the subtitles are correct to help you. So let's talk more about idioms. There's another idiom that we say, and it's Crimea River. We often say that when we don't care. Let's say my daughter wanted to go out on Friday night, but there was some reason she couldn't. And she was begging and she was crying. I could say, Crimea River, you are not going to go. No matter what you do, I'm not going to change my mind. Just for the record, my daughter wouldn't do that. She's not that type of person. If someone is in hot water or deep water, it means they are in trouble. Maybe I forgot about my wife's birthday. I would never do that. Could be said that I was in hot water with her or that I was in deep water with her. If you sell somebody down the river, that means you didn't back them up. You didn't have their back. If you have a friend and they weren't supportive, you could ask, why'd you sell me down the river? What I'm standing next to is definitely a river, but if it was a little smaller, we might call it a stream. And if it was even smaller than a stream, we might call it a creek. But those three bodies of water all have a current. The water flows. A body of water is what we call a good amount of water. Might be a river, might be a creek, might be a stream. If the water is not flowing, it might be a pond. And if it's a little bigger than a pond, we might call it a lake. 
but all of those are fresh water, meaning there is no salt. If it's salt water, then it's most likely an ocean. So salt water versus fresh water, salt water has salt. Fresh water does not. If a river or a pond or a lake is a popular place to swim, you might hear that place called a swimming hole. We would never call an ocean a swimming hole. They are usually smaller bodies of water. This river is not a swimming hole because it's somewhat polluted. Not many people swim here. This has been a long lesson. If you still want more English, right up there is a playlist of all kinds of listening comprehension exercises. Below that are some English field trips where I visit post office or a mega store. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Hello and welcome back to another video. If this is your first time here, welcome. My name is Brent. I've been an English teacher in the United States for 20 years and this is American English with this guy because that's what the sign says. If you stick around until the end of this video, you will know how to use scatter and spread at the beach, at a picnic, at a party, maybe even find an insult to call your friend. Basically, you will know how to use scatter and spread like a native, but remember, you don't want to sound like a native. You don't want to lose that accent that makes you unique. This question originally came from a live stream that I did this past weekend. If you want the link, I'll put it right up there. But the question actually comes from we. I thought it was a really good question, but maybe you don't have the time to sit through an hour of live stream. So I wanted to give you all of the information in less than five minutes. And I also have to give a shout out to Naima. What she did was she watched the live stream for the whole hour, took notes, and then from her notes created a comment where she used all the information she had gathered. What a great study strategy. She's much less likely to forget that information. The sign's back. Both of these verbs can mean the same thing. And basically you have some objects, they are close together, and then you disperse them or spread them out or scatter them or move them apart. But the two words do have a subtle difference. When you're spreading something, you're almost putting more thought into where the objects go. And when you scatter them, you're less likely to care where those objects go. Let's take spread. Maybe you're at the beach and you want to lay your towel down on the sand. You could say, I'm going to spread out my towel. Maybe you are going to a picnic and you don't want all of your food to get dirty, so you spread a blanket down before you eat. And because of the recent coronavirus, we've used spread a lot more often. When somebody gives the disease to other people, we can say that the virus is spreading. We also have something called community spread. And that is when many people are giving the virus to many others in the community. Let's say you have a garden and you are planting vegetables in a row. You might say you are spreading seeds, but maybe you're planting grass and you don't really care where the seeds go just as long as they get on the ground. You could say that you are scattering the grass seeds. Sometimes in the United States, Teenagers get together for a party. I know I did when I was a teenager. Sometimes they get together in the woods and do some underage drinking. You have to be 21 in the United States to legally drink alcohol. And of course, most teenagers, by definition, are not 21. They are 13 to 19. Yes, I did when I was younger. I did go to parties like this, but I promise I never did any drinking. It's true. I promise. You can ask my friends. I never drank while I was in high school. Oftentimes the teenagers are gathered around what's called a keg. 
It's a big barrel of beer a lot of times. But when the police come into the woods to break up that party, all of the teenagers scatter in different directions. We also have a term called scatterbrained. It's a bit of an insult, but it is also a little bit funny. I love to use the character Phoebe from Friends, and you could call her scatterbrained. Maybe her brain is thinking in all kinds of directions. I wanna give a shout out to some gold members of the channel, Jesus and Rod. If you guys are looking to become channel members, there is a link at the bottom of the screen. It says join, and it will take you to a video that explains more. I'd also like to give a shout out to Bob the Canadian. Maybe you've heard of him, but he has given this channel a lot of love lately. And I'd like to show you a playlist that has a lot of videos of mine, but also some of my favorite Bob the Canadian videos. Thank you for watching. I hope this helped. See you next time. Hello, and welcome back to another video. This is American English with this guy. I'm this guy. My name is Brent. I've been an English teacher in the United States for 20 years, and the goal of this channel is to help you improve your English. And the goal of today's video is to answer some questions I wasn't able to answer during this weekend's live stream. But right off the bat, first things first, I would like to thank Sita for the super chat she gave me during the live stream. In this lesson, I'm going to answer four questions. One, about the word leftover. Two, about the word frost. Three, about the word ain't. And finally, answer the question, how do you pronounce a word you've never seen before? I filmed the intro inside because it was raining. It has stopped raining, but it's still pretty foggy out. I wanted to get out here to make this video because over the next couple days, it is going to be pouring and I won't be able to get outside. In fact, tonight, the people who predict the weather say that we might lose electricity or we might lose power because the wind and rain will be so strong. Let's talk about the first question from Patty Candle. She's from France. Thank you so much for the question. And she's wondering about the word ain't. Well, ain't is a contraction. We have many of them in English, and one very common one is isn't. And that comes from two words, is not. A contraction is when you squish two short words together to make a little bit longer word, but still a pretty short word. So is not becomes isn't. And sometimes instead of saying isn't, you can say ain't. But to be honest, some Americans will think that ain't isn't exactly proper and maybe that you aren't as smart as you would like to be. Let's take it isn't raining out right now. I could say it is not raining out right now, or I could say it isn't raining out right now, or I could say it ain't raining out right now, because it isn't raining right now. It ain't raining right now. But again, ain't, some people might think you aren't as educated as you could be. Many Americans will use the word ain't, and it's fine. Just because I'm an English teacher, I don't use it, but that doesn't mean you can't. Here are a couple quick examples of sentences that contain ain't. It ain't working right now. I ain't going to work today. I ain't got no sugar in my house. It ain't gonna snow tomorrow. The next question comes from Holfi, and he's from Finland. He's wondering, how do you pronounce a word you've never seen before? It's a great question. It happens to me all the time when I'm studying my Italian, and I found one source that will help, and that is Google Translate. I know a lot of people don't like using it. I actually use it. I think it has gotten better over the last couple of years. Is it correct all the time? No, it's not. Is it better than nothing? I think that it is. Another resource, and I will 
leave the link down in the description box, is something called Forvo. Forvo, where native speakers will record some words that might help you. Sometimes when I'm looking for words in Italian, they aren't there, so it doesn't work all the time, but some of the time it can be really helpful. Mahdi from Saudi Arabia has the next one, and he didn't really ask a question, but he mentioned the word leftover, and I wanted to make sure everyone knew what that word was. And we just celebrated Thanksgiving here in the United States, and families will often have leftovers after the big Thanksgiving meal. And a leftover is exactly what it sounds like. It is parts of the meal, the food, dessert, pretty much anything that hasn't been eaten. And that will be saved for the next day or maybe even later on that day. Some people like to have leftovers as a midnight snack. And a midnight snack is also exactly what it sounds like. It's a snack that you have at midnight when everyone else is sleeping. You might raid the refrigerator for some of those midnight snacks. And the final question comes from Happy Mentor. First time I noticed Happy Mentor in the live chat and they really contributed a lot to the live chat. I think they know English pretty well, but they were wondering if you can hear frost on the trees. And a simple answer to that is no, you can't. Frost is usually found on the ground. In the summer, we have something called dew that will form on the grass overnight. It's wet, it's kind of like rain, even though it didn't rain the night before. The grass might be wet when you wake up. We call that dew. And in the winter, that freezes. So before we get snow for the year, the grass will often have frost on it. And frost is simply dew that is frozen. This morning when I woke up, it was 26 degrees Fahrenheit and there was actually dew on the ground. We haven't had snow yet that has stuck around. So probably until we get snow, the morning temperatures will be cold enough that we will have dew on the grass when we wake up. I wanna give a huge shout out to all of the channel members. They help support this channel each month. I wanna give a shout out to all the subscribers because you also help this channel. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you are looking for more videos, right up there is a video I did about semester, trimester, and quarter. Below that, I made a video about some of the phrasal verbs we use with the word keep. See you next time. Hey, just want to give a quick video here. My son and my wife and I are here to pick apples. So I want to give you a little tour around an apple farm. But as you can see, or as you will see, um, there's a lot more than just apples here. Actually, apples are a very small part of what's here. There's hard apple cider, which has alcohol, and the apple donuts, which are great, candy, pumpkins, so hopefully this will give you a little taste of what it's like in the United States during the season of fall. I'm home now and it's just a little easier to talk when there aren't a lot of people around. So what I want to talk to you about right now is a very popular pastime in the fall for Americans and Canadians and that is something called a hayride. Now that farm used to have hunted hayrides 
And a hayride is basically a, a tractor and it pulls uh, this wagon and people sit on the back and to make them more comfortable, they put hay in there and we call that a hayride. In fact, there are similar rides now at the farm so you can go get apples that are really far away. You can hop a free ride on this wagon and a tractor will pull you to the apples and then they'll take you back. Now, as we get closer to Halloween, some of those tractors will turn into haunted hay rides. People will get on the back of the tractor and they will go through the woods at night and people will jump out from the woods and scare them. And all of those people who jump out of the woods, they're paid by the farm to give people a scare. If you go on a haunted hayride, you're knowing that you're going to get scared. They may jump out of the woods dressed like ghosts or goblins or witches. They may even have chainsaws, but the sharp chain will not be attached to the chainsaw so it will only sound mean and they might even rub it against your leg and it could scare you because you think oh no this is going to cut me but in reality it's just there's a vibration and it might tickle and really scare you but if you notice there are now signs around the farm they don't say hayride or haunted hayride they say like a haunted walk and the reason is sadly a couple years ago in Maine, the state I live in, a girl, 16 years old, was killed on a haunted hayride when the tractor, the, um, she was on the wagon, the tractor actually hit a tree and there were a number of people injured, but she actually died. So I think that's why the farm that I went to today is no longer having a haunted hayride, they're having haunted walks. And as you can see from the video, uh, they're not quite set up yet. We're still about six weeks away from Halloween. But as we get closer, some of those things like um, an old amusement park ride, like a little kitty ride, it will be spooky. There is a place where it looks like there is a person there already, but it's a fake person. And there's like a prison and just heads and a cooler and some pretty scary stuff. If you are a person who likes to be scared, you might like haunted hay rides or haunted walks. Myself and Jamie, we don't really like that stuff, so we never go on them. Another thing the farm has is a little playground for children and they can go into miniature buildings or very small buildings that look like 
churches or schools or even prisons. So kids will like to play maybe cops and robbers in there and put their friends into that little fake jail. Nobody in my family has a fall birthday, but we have been to quite a few birthday parties at that farm for little children. They can play with the animals, they can play inside some of those structures. It's often a great place to spend a Saturday or Sunday celebrating a birthday. Hope you've learned a little bit about American culture, some terms we use during the fall. I will make a few more fall videos as we continue on through the fall. I'll definitely do a Halloween video, things like that. Leave in the comments anything you want to see that you've heard about in the United States dealing with fall. I'll try to make a video on it. If you're looking for more English, there are some playlists right there. Thank you so much for tuning in. See you next time. Hello, and welcome back to another video. This is American English with this guy. I'm this guy. My name is Brent. I've been an English teacher in the United States. The goal of this channel is to help you improve your English. And the goal of today's video is to help you understand when to use I, when to use me, when to use he, when to use him, when to use she, and when to use her. Right now I'm walking along a pretty empty soccer field. Yes, we call it soccer here in the United States. If you have been watching this channel for any length of time, you know that I'm not a real big fan of learning grammar. I do think it's necessary, but if I can give you a language hack so you don't have to study grammar, I think that's even better. So let me make this as simple as possible. I comes at the beginning of a sentence. Me comes at the end. Now will this work 100% of the time? I'm not sure. It's a hack. But will it work most of the time? Absolutely. I is always going to be the subject of the sentence. It's the thing that does the action. So you might say, I am going to the movies tonight. I am going with her. See, her comes at the end of the sentence. I could say she, that would be the subject. She always comes at the beginning of a sentence. She is going with her. Her comes at the end of a sentence. He comes at the beginning of a sentence. Him? comes at the end of the sentence. He is going with him. Me, her, and him always have the action done to them. Should we talk about them and they? They act like I, he, and she. They always comes at the beginning of a sentence. Them always comes at the end. The them has the action done to them. They, they do the action. And if you've been watching this channel, you also know that I love using going to the movies as an example. So they are going with them. He is going with him. She is going with her. I am going with me. Right, that last one doesn't make any sense but it's grammatically correct. And if you get these wrong, don't feel bad. Native English speakers get them wrong also. For example, let's think about this sentence. He is going with she and I. That's not wrong. A lot of native English speakers think you should use I all the time, but that's not the case. He is going with her and me. That's actually the correct way, but I bet most native speakers will not say it that way. He is going with me. That's correct. But for some reason, when English speakers add something else at the end, 
with themselves they always like to say I but it's no big deal it's just language right people will understand what you're saying if you get it wrong some of the time it's not a big deal right so one last time these are pronouns that come at the beginning of a sentence I he she they these are the pronouns that come at the end of a sentence me her him and them does that make sense I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible oh you know what we haven't talked about we and us yet okay really quickly we comes at the beginning us comes at the end sorry I gotta cut into the video my son is at hockey practice I'm editing the video in the car and I noticed I didn't mention you so you is pretty easy you comes at the beginning of the sentence you also comes at the end I also didn't mention anything about possessives like pronouns that show ownership that'll be for a later video All right now back to this video like I said will this work all the time I can't guarantee it because if you've been studying English for any length of time you know there is always an exception to the rule but I hope this hack helps I want to give a shout out to a couple awesome channel members Miho Sam Jesus Rod also check out my Instagram there are two minute lessons on there link is in the description box if you haven't seen my awesome conversation with Rod it's right up there right below that is when I took a field trip to my own school you want to see an American school check that video out please don't forget to subscribe thank you so much see you next time Oh no, we have the first damage from the hurricane. My neighbor's trash can blew over. Hello, and welcome back to another video. This is American English with this guy, I'm this guy. My name is Brent, and the goal of this channel is to help you improve your English. And the goal of today's video is to teach you a little bit more about hurricanes. The weather is calling for us to have a hurricane tomorrow. And over the weekend, a lot of people started talking about this hurricane because that's what it looks like now. It's supposed to, I guess, resemble a body part? I don't know. It's a little windy right now. I mean, the hurricane isn't even supposed to come until tomorrow, but the wind is already blowing. I hope you can hear me all right. Members, I have some members now, and they helped me buy a new microphone for my camera. So hopefully the wind is being blocked out by that new microphone. Yeah, I just listened to the playback and it sounded pretty good. But I do want to give a shout out to all of the members. Thank you so much. We got a bunch of new ones over the weekend, so talk about them so we're talking about Madi, Constantine, Angelo, Christopher and Bob the Canadian it's a big surprise this weekend something tells me he won't need any of the perks that come with being a member but I do want to give his other channel a shout out four days a week he has a video come out and it's super short five minutes and it gives you a lot to learn for English I'll put a link right up there so you can find his channel. So according to that picture, the hurricane started in Florida and made its way up the coast. From what I hear right now, it is in North Carolina and headed my way in Maine. Luckily, by the time it gets to me, it probably will no longer be a hurricane. It might be a tropical storm, or tropical depression actually the longer I look at that picture it does look a little bit like a body part leave a comment if that hurricane track the path that it's taking reminds you of a part of the human body I'm curious 
Thankfully, where I live in Maine, the water is usually much cooler than it is in Florida, and hurricanes love warm water. They die out when the water gets a little cooler. A storm becomes a hurricane when the winds reach 74 miles an hour. And there are five different categories for hurricanes. The lowest at 74 miles an hour is called a category one or cat one. And cat five is the strongest and there is no cat six. Right now we have a tropical storm warning for tomorrow and tropical storms can be anywhere from 38 miles an hour to 74 miles an hour. And below that, we call it a tropical depression. But one of the strange things about hurricanes is that most people don't die because of the wind. They die because of the storm surge. And that is when big waves push up against the coast and people unfortunately drown. When a storm is strong enough to become a hurricane, it gets a name and the names go in alphabetical order. So you might hear names like Hurricane Bob or Hurricane Gloria. And if a storm does enough damage, that name will be retired and never used again. Back in 1985, my state was hit with Hurricane Gloria and there will never be another Hurricane Gloria. That name has been retired, no longer able to be used. I was about 10 years old when Hurricane Gloria came through and I do remember there was a little wind but a lot of flooding on the coast near the ocean because of the storm surge. Thankfully no Mainers were killed during that storm. Like I said where I live in Maine most of the time when a hurricane comes through it's kind of weak and doesn't do a whole lot of damage. Because members get videos early, Angelo had a question about what the difference between a hurricane and a typhoon is. And you might hear both of those terms in English. Hurricanes happen only in the Atlantic Ocean. Typhoons happen only in the Pacific Ocean. I hope this mini lesson gave you a better understanding of hurricanes. Jamie and I need to do one on tornadoes because we've experienced one. We've actually had a house destroyed by a tornado. I do have two other weather related videos if you would like to see them. One is called Weather Terms You Didn't Know and below that is a video on thunderstorms. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Hello and welcome back to another video. This is American English with this guy. I'm this guy. My name is Brent. I've been teaching English in the United States for over 20 years. And the goal of this channel is to help you improve your English. And the goal of today's video is to show you how to use the prefix miss. But before we get into the video, I want to give a few huge shout outs for some subscribers and members who have been adding subtitles to some of my videos. In fact, my latest video right up there now has Brazilian Portuguese subtitles, thanks to Rod. Eugene added Russian subtitles, and for the first time ever, we have Turkish subtitles, thanks to Ali. Thank you so much. And if you wait until the end of this video, I will have links to playlists for all of those subtitles. Now on to today's video. Remember, I just mentioned that previous video I did, and in it, I briefly mentioned how to use the prefix miss. You can put it before a verb, and it will give the idea that something is wrong. Before we get into miss, maybe we should briefly talk about pre, another prefix, prefix, meaning before. So a prefix always comes before the root word. Like in this word, misdiagnose. Diagnose is a pretty hard word, but it's pretty common. When you go to the doctor, your doctor will hopefully diagnose you correctly. 
meaning they find out what is wrong and they help you fix it. Maybe they give you some medication to help fix whatever's wrong with you. But if the doctor misdiagnoses you, that means they got it wrong. That means they might have even made you worse. So when you go to the doctors, you hope your doctor will not misdiagnose you. You hope they will diagnose you correctly, tell you exactly what is wrong so you can get better. The other time we use diagnose, it's actually not even related to a doctor. It's related to your car. So if there is a problem with your car and you bring it into the mechanics or the mechanics shop, they will hopefully diagnose what is wrong with your car. Hopefully they won't misdiagnose you because that could cost you more money and possibly more time. It's not very fun when your car has to stay in the shop. That's what we say when the mechanic is working on your car. You can't have your car and maybe you have to rent a car or borrow a car from a friend or a family member. The next verb I'd like to talk about is match. So when two things come together and it's a good thing, we might say, oh, it's a match. If you look at the thumbnail, I have some mismatched socks. So two socks that actually aren't the same color, the same kind. We can use this for couples who are dating. Maybe they are a good match. But if they don't work out, if they break up, like I talked about in the last video, then maybe they are a mismatch. The next one I want to talk about is place. So if you use the verb place, you put it somewhere. So maybe every time you come home from work, you place your keys in the same place. But if you lose your keys, maybe by accident, maybe you didn't put them where you should, you can say, oh, I have misplaced my keys. Miss, wrong, maybe as in lost. I recently did a video about what we call baby animals and puppies was the first one. And hopefully if you have a puppy, you treat it well. You feed the puppy when you should, you play with the puppy, but if you treat it badly, you can say that you are mistreating that puppy. And in fact, in the United States, if you mistreat a dog, you can pay a fine, possibly even go to jail. Let's talk about that couple. They were a mismatch, maybe because one of the people mistreated the other person. Maybe they cheated on them. That would be mistreatment. Let's talk about the verb manage. That means to take care of in a good way. You might manage your funds every month, the money that you have. But if you spent a little too much on that meal last night, or maybe you spent too much on that fancy dress and you don't have enough money at the end of the month, you might say that you have mismanaged your money or mis managed your funds. In a classroom, the teacher wants to be able to manage that classroom, make sure everyone is learning, making sure that everyone is safe. Well, if they mismanage the classroom, well then students aren't safe and they probably aren't learning very well. And in that classroom that is mismanaged, probably the students are misbehaving. They are behaving in the wrong way. They are not doing what they are supposed to do. So yes, I am an English teacher, but one thing that I do quite often, if you've been in one of my live streams, you know this. I often misspell words. I spell them the wrong way. I hope that I never misread your comments, but of course, sometimes that happens too. And if I misread your comment, that could lead to a misunderstanding. 
Maybe I don't quite understand what you're trying to ask or what you're trying to say. I haven't understood it correctly. I've misunderstood it. Or, this is a tricky word to say, maybe I misinterpreted what you said. Misinterpret, misinterpreted. That's a difficult word for even a native English speaker. But to misinterpret something means that you didn't understand it. So if you see a person with a face like this, maybe you interpret they are upset. But maybe you misinterpreted their face. Maybe they just have a really bad headache. Another verb we use with miss in the front is fire. So if somebody, let's say there is a battle going on and they are firing off rockets, if one of the rockets doesn't go where it is supposed to go, we might say that was a misfire or they misfired that rocket. That person who misfired the rocket, maybe they misjudged where that target was. When you mismanaged your money for the month, maybe you misjudged exactly how much money you would need for rent. So the verb judge is very close to the verb guess. You might judge how much money you will need to spend. You might judge exactly where that rocket needs to land. When you first meet a person, maybe you think they are really nice, but after you know them for a while, maybe you misjudge them and they're not so nice. You guessed they were a good person, but it turned out you were wrong. When you label something, that means you put the name next to whatever it is. When we go to the gas station in the United States, there are often three types of gasoline and they are all labeled. If that gasoline is mislabeled, it could damage your car. I'm going to be doing an ice cream tasting video very soon. I know I have talked about it a lot, but most ice cream cones, I wish I had one now, have a certain shape to them, but they could be misshapen. Maybe that ice cream cone is leaning or flopping over to one side. If somebody breaks their nose and it doesn't go back into place like it used to, maybe we could call that nose misshapen. We also have the verb to mislead. And that is very close to lying. Maybe not quite so bad, but you're not telling the whole truth. Maybe there is a criminal in front of a judge and they're telling their story, but they are leaving out important details. You could say that that criminal was misleading the judge. I talked about gasoline earlier. And the way you use gasoline is you put it in your car and it makes the engine run. But if you misuse gasoline, maybe you use it to start a fire, somebody's house. That would definitely be misusing gasoline and you might be called a misfit for starting a fire. A misfit, it's a noun and it means someone who doesn't quite fit into society. You could probably call a criminal, certainly somebody who starts a fire at somebody's house, a misfit. I hope now you know everything you wanted to know about the prefix miss. As I said before, there are a bunch of different playlists with subtitles up there. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Hello and welcome back to another mega lesson. This mega lesson is going to be about homophones. This is American English with this guy. I'm this guy, my name is Brent. And if you are looking to get better at English, you've come to the right place. It's an absolutely beautiful day out where I live. Unfortunately, we haven't had rain in several weeks. So I'm watering my lawn. And remember, homophones are those words in English that sound alike, but they look different 
and they also have different meanings. But before we get into actual homophones, I want to break down the word homophone. Break down meaning split it up into its parts. We have two parts, homo and phone, and they are both Latin and Greek roots. I had to go inside to turn the water off so I can move my sprinkler. It's, it's a whole thing. The sprinklers moved the waters back on, but now it's kind of windy. I hope you guys can hear me okay. Homo means the same. And one of the most common words with homo is homosexual. And if you think about it, a homosexual is someone who likes their own gender or the same gender. Phone, it means sound like microphone. Micro means small, and a microphone is something small that makes your voice big. Mini is another Latin and Greek root for small. This is a mega lesson. Mega means big. A megaphone, I'll put a picture up of it, is something that makes your voice big. It was around a lot before a microphone was invented. And before you say anything, yes, I know the shed door is still broken, but homophones, they are words that sound alike. Homophones. It's a little windy out there. I'm in my garage right now, but the first pair of homophones I'd like to talk about is sale and sail. So the first sail you often find on boats that we call sailboats. And in the first mega lesson, that I filmed at a river, we could say that a sailboat could sail down that river. But the next kind of sail almost always has something to do with money. Someone is selling something and someone will be buying that something. For instance, a house. There's a house in my neighborhood that was built about three years ago and it still has not sold, or at least I didn't think it had sold. But as I am walking down to try to use that house as an example, there is a moving van in front of it. So trying not to be too creepy, but behind me, there are actually people moving into that house. You might be able to see there is a U-Haul truck, and that is something that will carry furniture to a new house. So I won't be too creepy and go down there and film, but you saw the moving van and there was a for sale sign right near those mailboxes. Not far from that house that was just sold, there is also some land for sale. And you can see that for sale sign right below my left shoulder. The next homophone pair comes from a member, Miho, and she was asking about right and right. Should I also mention I have a different shirt on or do you care? I'm filming this on a different day. You can write your name with your right hand, but I'm left-handed. So I will write my name with my left hand. My camera doesn't want to get straight on this tripod, I'm sorry. But I'm wondering how many of you are left-handed? Please leave a comment. I'm left-handed and I have heard that only 10% of the population is actually left-handed. And if you write your own name, we also call that your autograph. I know this video is about homophones, but I can't help myself. Sometimes I need to talk about the Latin and Greek roots. So auto means self, graph means write. So you will write your name by yourself. The next homophone pair that we should probably talk about is pear and pear. The first pear is something you can eat, not my favorite fruit. And the other pear is always two two of something. So you could have a pair of pears. 
Often when a couple likes each other or is dating, you might hear it said, they make a lovely pair. And another word we have in English like pair is couple. The next pair of homophones is flower and flower. And I looked through my cabinets and I didn't think we had any flour, but I did find this, and this is called cake flour. It's a little bit more fine than all-purpose flour, but we did have some all-purpose flour. And this is the type of flour that we call that's pretty much good for making anything that requires flour. And this is the other kind of flour. Jamie actually grew these in our front yard. I just don't know the name of these flowers. Peonies, maybe? I'm actually back outside for a second, doing some more watering on the next day. And the next pair of homophones I'd like to talk about is pale and pale. And that's a little tomato plant that was given to me as a gift that I'm trying to grow and not kill like I do with most of the plants that are given to me. Wow, this is heavy to hold like this, but this is what we might call a watering pail or a watering can. And it's quite hot out here. If I stayed outside too long without any water, my face might start to turn pale. Pail, like that, is a bucket or pail for carrying things. And pail, like that, means to turn white or to lose color. If someone's face is becoming pale, it's not a good thing. And remember, the great thing about homophones, if you are just speaking to someone, doesn't matter the spelling. It only matters when you write out the homophone. And I'm gonna put a picture up right there. I've also put it in the community tab on this channel, but I really believe it. If anyone ever makes fun of your English, don't worry about it. At least you know at least two languages, and that person probably only knows English. And they might not even know English all that well. Learning a new language is super tough. Never let anyone tell you otherwise. Keep up the great job. Remember how I was saying we could use some rain at the beginning of this video? Looks like it might happen. Let's say that it does rain and the wind is picking up, so it actually might rain. We could say, if it's raining really hard, that it is pouring. Which brings me to the next pair of homophones, poor and poor. Unfortunately, if somebody doesn't have any money, we might call them poor, or a slang term in the United States is po. But let's take my pail again, which is a lot lighter this time. If I'm tipping it this way, I can pour water from it. I do want to thank Corrine Jackson for giving me the idea to do this homophones video. And I would also like to thank Elena and Luke for becoming silver members. If you would like to become a member of this channel and get a few extra videos a week, take a look. There should be a join button down there. But all of the English lessons will be absolutely free. You'll never have to pay to learn English on this channel. It is actually starting to rain, drop just hit me. So I will be brief. It actually looks like it might start to pour. The sun is no longer out, but I have a son. His name is Ace. I am going to eat this piece of chocolate we often say piece for when it is part of a bigger something. For instance, piece of cake, piece of pie. And often when we leave, we say peace. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like some more English learning, take a look up there. It's a slang playlist from slang videos all across YouTube. 
And below that is some Brazilian Portuguese subtitled videos of mine. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time before it rains. Hello and welcome back to another video. Today's video is all about making you sound smarter in English. I have four words for you. Yes, they're big. Maybe they are a little hard to pronounce, but I will help you pronounce them, help you define them, and use them in a couple example sentences. These four words are quite common in everyday conversation and say a lot by using only one word. The first word is inexplicable. 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 Inexplicable means you just can't explain it. I can never find my car keys in the morning. It's inexplicable. He never understands what I say. It's inexplicable. His motive for leaving his job is inexplicable. Inexplicable can also be used as an adverb by adding ly. The word will then become inexplicably. Inexplicably. And remember, if I'm talking too quickly, you can always slow down my speech in the settings section. Every time I sit down to study English, the phone inexplicably rings. A good word to use when you can't explain something. The next word is simultaneously. 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 Simultaneously means two things happening at the same exact time. How can it simultaneously be sunny and rainy? My stomach doesn't feel very well, yet I'm simultaneously hungry. Simultaneously is one of those words that if you look at it and try to pronounce it, it's probably going to be pretty hard because we don't actually pronounce that U sound in the middle. We almost make it an I sound. Simultaneously. I am able to study my English while I simultaneously eat my dinner. A great word for describing how two things can be done at the same time. If you find this video at all useful, make sure you hit that subscribe button. The next word is ubiquitous. Ubiquitous. Ubiquitous is a great word to use when something seems to be everywhere. Of course, the air we breathe is ubiquitous. Ads on YouTube videos might seem to be ubiquitous. In the United States, during the 4th of July, fireworks are ubiquitous. 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 In the food we eat, sugar seems to be ubiquitous. At the beach today, the seagulls seem to be ubiquitous. For a time, coronavirus cases seem to be ubiquitous. Since some of these words are difficult to pronounce and I am speaking fairly slowly, you may want to try to shadow some of the sentences that I am saying. For each sentence I say, try pausing the video and repeating after me. That's what we call shadowing and it can really help with your pronunciation. The next word is apathetic. Apathetic. Apathetic means not caring at all, showing very little emotion. He had a wedding to go to today, but he felt pretty apathetic towards the event. As the school year ended, the students felt apathetic towards their schoolwork. The child begged for his toy, but the mom was apathetic. She felt he needed to be punished. I hope you don't feel apathetic towards my videos. If you're still watching, you're probably not apathetic. And if you are watching these videos, you are not apathetic towards learning English. I'm sure you feel very passionate about it. Maybe you are just starting your English binge watching for the day. May I suggest this video if you haven't seen it? I think a great one on learning how to use prepositions. And below that is a playlist on learning English with the TV show, The Office. Don't forget to subscribe and I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Hello and welcome back to another mini lesson. Today's mini lesson comes from a suggestion from Marina and she lives in Ukraine. 
And she was wondering, what are some other ways that we can say someone is smart in English? And you can see I am inside my house today because it might rain out. In fact, my weather app is calling for drizzle and I'll put a picture of what it says right there. And I recently have made a video on the difference between drizzle and sprinkle, if you'd like to check it out. Viet wrote a comment on how he likes it when I'm out in the streets better. And quite frankly, I do too. I just can't be out there today. So the first way you can call someone smart without saying smart is calling them wise. And when we hear the word wise in English, it often implies a person who has seen a lot, a person who is a little bit older. You might hear a wise old man or a wise old woman. If someone is younger but wise, you sometimes hear it said they are wise beyond their years. Or you might hear it said they are an old soul. So someone who is young but seems like they have experienced a lot in their young life. I know there are a couple subscribers who are in their early 20s but they've told me they would rather stay at home on a Friday night studying English rather than going out to party, like many young 20-year-olds would like to do. We could call them old souls or wise beyond their years. The next one is bright. If someone is young but very smart, we can call them bright. You might hear, what a bright young man or what a bright young woman. The next way to call someone smart without saying smart is clever. We often use clever when someone finds a unique way or a different way to complete something. Let's say your car is broken, but you have this really clever friend. They haven't had any training. They just know how to fix cars. They're really clever. If someone finds a new way to solve a math problem, we could call them clever. Another really close term to clever is brilliant. You could call the really smart person brilliant or even the thing they did brilliant. When your friend fixes that car, you can say, wow, you're brilliant or you fixed my car? That's brilliant. You could also describe that person as being a genius. Often when I hear the word genius, I think of Albert Einstein. That guy was pretty smart. If you are finding anything helpful in this video, please think about subscribing. There should be a button down there somewhere. I'd also like to give a shout out to some people who have recently become members of this channel. Nori, Rod, Jesus, Miho, Amon, Gleb, thank you so much. And I saved my favorite for last, and that is Savvy. Savvy is a lot like clever, finding unique ways to do things. Someone who's really good at computers and maybe never even went to school to figure out how to work with computers, we could call them tech savvy. Do you have that friend that when your phone breaks or you have a problem with it, you take it to them and they just know how to figure it out? Yeah, we'd call that person tech savvy. Maybe you have a friend that just knows how to dress really well. We might call them fashion savvy. If this mini lesson was too short for you, there are still a couple playlists you can check out. This one right up here, Russian subtitles. Real Russian subtitles that Eugene added. And below that, Brazilian Portuguese subtitles added by Daniel and Rod. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Hello, and welcome back to another video. Today's video is actually going to be an English field trip. I haven't done one of these in quite a while because of that whole coronavirus thing. The virus made it difficult to go anywhere and made it even more difficult to film. And even still to walk into the post office, 
I had to have on a mask. And as you could see from the title, we are going to a typical American post office. I know how so many of you like the mattress, so I thought I should do a video featuring the mattress. The reason I had to go to the post office was because I needed to get some stamps. And my stamps came in a little plastic envelope like this. I needed stamps so I could send a letter to my friend's mother. She lives in what we call a long-term facility. A few years ago, this might have been called an old person's home. We don't call it that anymore. To some, it sounds insensitive. Insensitive or a little mean, a little uncaring. Unfortunately, my friend's mom hasn't been able to see her family in over two months. So my friend Brian asked all of his friends to send his mom a letter to cheer her up. And that phrasal verb cheer up means to make happy. So I sent her a letter with this book of stamps. And as you can see, they are Sesame Street stamps. One of my favorite shows when I was a kid back in the 1970s. My favorite character is right there. His name is Ernie and his buddy Bert. Loved those guys when I was a kid. Who am I kidding? I still love those guys. This book of stamps costs about $10. Unfortunately, where my friend's mom lives, they have had a few positive cases for the coronavirus. Thankfully, she has not tested positive so far. She is 84 years old and we definitely hope she never gets the virus. If you would like to send her a letter, I'm sure she would like to get one from you since you probably live somewhere else in the world besides the United States. You can pause the video here if you would like her address or I will put it in the description box below. If you do plan on sending her a letter and you would like me to check your English for you, just leave the letter in the comments below and I'll correct it for you. Unless it's perfect, then of course I will tell you it's perfect. So enough of me talking, let's go to the post office. Luckily, the post office is only five minutes from my house. And remember, when Americans say five minutes from my house, they mean it will take me five minutes to drive there in my car if I do the speed limit. Hey, so I'm at the post office right now. I'm about to go in and get those stamps, but when I give you the tour, I will do it with a voiceover because I have to wear a mask inside. And this post office was built in 1962. John F. Kennedy was president. And all of those boxes along the wall are called post office boxes. If people do not want their mail delivered directly to their house, they can rent one of these boxes each month. They won't own it. They will only rent it. And this is opposite the post office. You can see we have a McDonald's and way up there is a D'Angelo's sandwich shop. Pretty much like a subway, but only local to this area, New England. And then there is a place where you can get parts for your car. There is a dollar store. I would love to do a tour of that when the coronavirus ends. And a couple stores over here that I don't really know. One side of that store looks vacant, looks empty. And then maybe the other side's empty too, I'm not sure. Thank you so much for watching. 
The Mattress. Thanks you so much for watching. If you're looking for more English, take a look at that playlist. That is all English listening comprehension exercises. And right below that are some of my favorite English YouTube videos that I've made so far. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Oh, and welcome back to another video. Today's video is all about finding other ways to tell someone to shut up. If this is your first time here, my name is Brent. I've been an English teacher in the United States for over 20 years. And the goal of this channel is to help you improve your English. Now, normally I wouldn't cover a topic like this. It is a little rude, but last week in the live stream, this question came up two days in a row. I believe the question was, how do you tell someone to politely shut up? Because let's face it, if you tell someone to shut up or stop talking, most people are probably going to find that rather rude. But let's face it, everyone has that someone in their life who will not stop talking. Today I have six ways to tell someone to shut up, but I can't promise that all of them will be polite. In fact, a couple of them are rather rude, but English learning can't be serious all the time. Sometimes you gotta have a little fun. The first way to tell someone to shut up or stop talking would be to put your fingers to your lips and make this sound. Shh. Many teachers in the US will shush their students. And yes, that's the verb, shush. But most adults will find this rude if you shush them. In fact, they might ask, did you just shush me? So be careful when you ask someone to be quiet and you shush them, you might have to get ready to fight, which is why next week's video will be six ways to defend yourself. This next one comes from Michael Scott from the television show, The Office. Sometimes you will hear Michael Scott say, Sh uh, shut it, Sh shut it. Uh, shut it. So the next one is shut it. And that is referring to someone's mouth. You literally want them to shut it like a door and not open it back up again. Still quite rude. So I would advise you to only use some of these on children, people who are smaller than you and people you can run faster than. The next one is zip it zip it zip it so zip it much like shut it is you want them to close their mouth much like a zipper zipping up a jacket the next one is shut your pie hole meaning the hole from which you eat pie and i gotta give credit to this one jesus mentioned this in one of our video chats if you would like to participate in a monthly video chat, check that join button below to become a member. He asked me about my upcoming videos and I talked about this one and I said, shut your pie hole. And Jesus said, don't forget, shut your cake hole. And that is one I had forgotten. I guess it's possible you could call your mouth a hole for pretty much anything you eat, your cake hole, your pie hole, your cheese hole, your pizza hole. Shut your sushi hole. That's hard to say. Sushi hole. Such, su shut your sushi hole. Uh, maybe, let's forget about sushi hole. Shut your pasta hole. I like that one. If you would like to add any other food type holes, leave it in the comments below. Shut your hot dog hole. And we do have a couple names in English for people who like to talk a lot. Motormouth is one that you might hear, or blabbermouth. Blabbermouth could also be used for someone who likes to gossip. And another term that mostly the boomers like is chatty Cathy. A chatty Cathy is someone who will never stop talking. Another one, and this might be more of a New England thing, maybe some New England slang, but we often say pipe down, pipe down, when we want someone to be quiet. I don't know where it comes from, and I don't think it has anything to do with a pipe. With these next couple examples, you are less likely to get your butt kicked. 
I should probably put a disclaimer on this video. Use these sayings at your own risk. But for one that's a little more polite, could you be quiet, please? You've added please, that's nice, but still you're asking someone to stop talking. And this last one is more of a way or a technique to get someone to stop talking. If someone is being a blabbermouth or a motormouth or a chatty Cathy, you might say, hang on, did you hear something? Even if there isn't a noise, that might cause them to stop talking and think. Maybe they will lose track of what they were trying to say. And that might give you a chance to start talking. Before we go, I would like to thank Sam the Taiwanese for becoming a channel member. I hope you have enjoyed this less serious video. If you're looking for even more English today, I'll put up a couple videos that you can look at. And don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for tuning in. See you next time. I have a new microphone for this video, so I hope it sounds good. So today's video is the first in what I hope will be a series of videos called Quick Classes. Most weeks I do between four and five live streams. That's four or five hours of learning English for you if you choose to watch all of the live streams. And now that people are going back to work because quarantine is hopefully ending in your country, you may not have enough time to watch all four or five hours each week. So what I would like to do is condense those four or five hours or boil down those four or five hours into about 10 minutes of teaching. Now, I know there are a few of you who watch the live streams, re-watch the live streams, take notes. Naima, I know you're one of them. But this can also serve as a review. I truly believe that if you hear the material once, it's good. If you hear it twice, even better. Three times, maybe even better than two or one. Ten questions each week that came up in the live streams and I will condense it into about 10 minutes. This also allows me to give shout outs to some of the subscribers who asked really good questions. So I've also noticed watching this video back, I say so quite a bit. I'll try not to do that anymore. So the, oh, I said it again. The first question comes from Rod in Brazil. And he says, when should we use on the channel versus in the channel? It's a little windy out here, so I'm going to put this thing on my microphone. It's called a dead cat, and it is supposed to buffer the wind. Sorry for all you cat lovers out there. So to answer Rod's question, we almost always use the preposition on this channel. So you might say, oh, how did you learn how to use get along? Oh, I saw it on American English with this guy's channel, on. But let's say you were looking at your phone to find out what time it is. You would say, I'm looking at my phone. But then if somebody asks you, oh, how did you know the time? Oh, I looked on my phone. So prepositions with technology can be a little tricky. You also look on the computer for information or you look on the internet. But let's say you accidentally dented your computer and you want your friend to see it. You would say, oh man, look at my computer. I dented it. But if there was something interesting on the screen, you would say, hey, look on my screen, something cool here. But like I always say about most prepositions, if you get it wrong, it really won't affect the meaning of your sentence. The native speaker will still understand what you're saying. It might just sound a little off, a little different. Don't sweat it. Don't worry too much about it. Just lots and lots of listening and you will understand how to use those prepositions more easily. Lots and lots of listening.
All right, we got a little bonus question here. This comes from the comments section, but Marina from Ukraine was wondering what we call this stuff. And we actually call it lattice. Lattice, not lettuce, not the green stuff, lattice. And yes, some people do grow flowers, maybe tomatoes on these things, but sometimes it's just used for decoration. The next question comes from Mega from India, and she's wondering what are the levels of college called? And we have a few. The first two years of college, we would say you have gotten your associate's degree. The first four years of college, we call that bachelor's degree. After bachelor's, two years after that, usually comes a master's degree. And two years after that comes your doctorate or your PhD. Not everyone takes the same exact path in college, but that is probably the most common. So William asked about how to use may and might in the future tense. So when we say may or might, that means that it could happen. We're not exactly sure if it will happen. And may and might actually mean the same thing. You can use whichever you'd like, but let's say it may rain tomorrow. It might rain tomorrow, meaning, I don't know, it could. Could is also very similar to might or may. And if you would like to ask a question using that word, you could say, might it rain tomorrow? But the no more natural thing to say would be, will it rain tomorrow? I may have pizza for dinner. I might have pasta. There are some woods behind my house. And during one of the live streams this week, I did mention how my neighbor actually killed a rabid fox that attacked his cat. That fox had rabies and it came from that woods. I'm not going into those woods right now, that's for sure. All right, the next question comes from my man Daniel out of Brazil. And he has actually added some Brazilian Portuguese subtitles to one of my videos. I'll put the link right at the top just in case you speak Brazilian Portuguese. It might help, I don't know. But his question was, what is the difference between salary and wages, salary and wages. In English, if somebody is on salary, we say they get paid by the year. For instance, teachers in the United States were paid by salary. We don't have to work a set number of hours a week. We get paid the same. The normal work week in the United States is about 36 to 40 hours. Most people who work salary, they work more hours than that. But you may also hear hourly wages. Those people get paid depending on the number of hours they work per week. And even though I'm paid by the year, I still get a paycheck every two weeks. Kareen Jackson is wondering, what is the most common term we use for a bathroom or a washroom, or a restroom. In the United States, you will hear bathroom most of the time. Sometimes in a public place like a restaurant, they might call it a restroom, but we definitely do not use washroom that often in the United States. If you want to know more about the American bathroom or the typical American bathroom, I made a video I'll put a link right up there. It's very early on in this channel, about four months ago. Might be terrible, but if you wanna check it out, I'll put it right up there. Eugene wanted to know in English, what is the difference between cooker and stove? And I'll also include oven in that conversation. But to answer that question, we should probably go to my kitchen. would 
be called the stove top, and that part would be called the oven, but that is the microwave oven. This is what we call an air fryer. It's a great device, almost like an oven, only it will cook things nicely in the summer without heating your whole house up. You can do small things like french fries, pizza, not big things. And that is what we call a cooker or a slow cooker. Great for soups and stews in the winter, but it takes all day to cook your food, eight to 10 hours. The next question comes from Mary from Iran, and she also added some subtitles to one of my videos, Persian subtitles. I'll leave the link right up there. And she wondered, what does at a boy, at a girl mean? And this is a question I simply missed. You know, Mary, I would never skip your question on purpose. I just missed it. At a boy and at a girl comes from that's a boy, that's a girl, I think. And we say this when somebody has done a really good job. Maybe my son comes home with a really good report card. Maybe he had really good grades. I might say, at a boy. I don't say that. It's not my style. If people say that, they would say it when somebody has done something really good or they have done something really well. Maybe my daughter was running track and she won the race. I might say, at a girl, if I was that kind of dad. I have other ways to congratulate my children. Next question is from Anna Lang. Anna, thank you so much for tuning in. And she is wondering, what does anywho mean? This is another question I missed. I'm sorry, I did not skip. I missed it, I didn't see it. We often say anywho in a joking way as a transition when somebody says something maybe awkward or cringy. Picture this, you're with a group of friends, maybe one person you don't know that well, and you're talking about this big party on Friday night. And suddenly the person you don't know that well says, last night my cat ate a spider. You all might stare at each other for a second. So to transition from that awkward sentence, you might say, anywho, about that party Friday night. The next question is from Luke from Poland. And he's wondering about the word odds when we're talking about numbers, things like that. You may have heard of the word odd, and that often means strange, maybe cringy. That person who talked about his random cat eating a random spider, that might be a little odd. But when we talk about the odds of something happening, it means the percentage or how likely is it. Let's go back to the example I often use, rain tomorrow. You might say, what are the odds that it might rain tomorrow? You're asking that person basically 50-50, is it likely 80-20? What are the odds? What's the percentage of it raining tomorrow? And the last question is from Nikita. And I read this the wrong way during that live chat. He was asking, why do we call dog days of summer, the dog days of summer. I thought he was asking, what does it mean? It seems like he already knew what it meant. Just in case you weren't in that live chat, I said the dog days of summer usually happen in August. It's often when it is very hot outside and it's so hot that people often become lazy. If you have spent any time around dogs, you might know that they can be quite lazy creatures. They sleep a lot during the day and also at night. So the dog days of summer just means it is a time to be lazy. Hopefully you're floating in a pool or at the ocean or floating in a lake with not a whole lot to do. If you are interested, I have made a video about all idioms using dog things. So check that out if you'd like. If you aren't quite ready to finish your English learning for the day, 
Right up there is a playlist of all the live streams that I've ever done, probably close to three days worth of material. Below that is a playlist of euphemisms and idioms that I've made. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, for watching the live streams. Thank you so much for sticking through this video. I hope it helped you learn a little something. See you next time. Hello and welcome back to another video. Today's video is going to be all about what we call baby animals in English. To be honest, this is probably not going to be one of the more useful videos I've done. I don't know how often you will use baby animal names in English, but I think this video can be pretty fun. And like with most of my videos, I will try to teach you more than just the names of baby animals. I'll also teach you a little bit about American culture along the way. I would love to give a huge shout out to Mega from India. She recently became a channel member. If you would like to do the same, there is a join button below. When you become a member, you will get early access to many videos and a monthly video chat. Mega would also like me to mention the names we give to animal groups, but I think that will become a different video. If this video has enough views and seems popular, I will talk about like a group of crows is called a murder of crows and a group of sheep, they are called a flock of sheep, dogs, pack of dogs, but we'll save that for a later video. I think this video will be quite long, so sit back, relax, maybe grab a pen or a pencil and some paper for some notes, and you might want to turn on those subtitles because they will be accurate. To try to make this video a little more fun, I am going to structure it in the way I would structure a quiz for my students in the classroom. So I will give you a couple hints before I actually say the name of the animal and then give the name we call that baby animal. But here's a hint. If you don't want to learn the name for all these baby animals, just simply add the word baby before the animal name. For instance, if you see a shark and it's a baby shark, just call it baby shark, baby squirrel, baby fox. It's a good way to call baby names for animals. But if you clicked on this video and you're still watching, then you want to know the names of these baby animals. So let's get started. This first animal is a very popular pet in the United States. Maybe the most popular pet. It has four legs. In English, we sometimes call this animal man's best friend. Any ideas? It's a dog and baby dogs are called puppies. Come on, what's cuter than a puppy? Were you able to get the animal name before I said it? All right, let's try another one. This is also a very popular pet in the United States. Maybe the most popular or second most after dog. These animals have four legs, they drink milk, and they sometimes kill mice, which is the plural form of mouse. Any ideas? It's a cat and we call baby cats kittens. All right, this next animal is not so much a pet. In fact, you will mostly see this animal on farms. The meat of this animal is eaten by humans, but it's not very popular in the United States. I have a friend who is from Namibia and he says they eat this animal a lot in Namibia. In the United States, we might drink the milk from this animal. And I have actually had 
a dessert called fudge made with this animal's milk, and it's pretty good. This animal rhymes with boat. Yes, it's a goat, and we call baby goats kids. And that is where the name for baby children come from. You will sometimes hear them called kids. Older people, mostly boomers, will be unhappy if you call little children kids. And you might hear them say, oh, kids are baby goats. These are children. But most people my age or younger have no problem with calling children kids. And remember, if you have many of these things, humans, they're children, but only one is called a child. The next one, this is our first animal that lives in the water. And their mouths, they have something coming from their mouth, and we call that a bill. The guys, the males for this animal, are actually more beautiful than the women, or the girls, or the ladies. You will see the guys a really bright green, and you will see the women, or the girls, or the ladies, or the females, they're uh, a muted gray. They're not very bright. And this animal name rhymes with a very bad word that starts with F. Yes, it's a duck. And these babies are called ducklings. You may also hear certain ducks called mallards. All right, we've had four animals so far. Have you gotten all four before I said the name? All right, here we go. The next one. This animal lives on a farm. It has four legs. It gives us something that we make clothing from called wool. Some people will eat this animal and when they do, the meat is called mutton. Any ideas? It's a sheep. And if you have one sheep, it's a sheep. If you have two sheep, it's still a sheep. And their babies are called lambs. This next animal lives in the woods, covered in fur, has four legs, hibernates, during the winter, which means they probably go into a cave and just sleep all winter long. This animal is famous in a fairy tale that I know is told a lot in the United States, Canada, Europe, a family of three, they eat porridge, they have soft beds, hard beds, a little girl named Goldilocks visits them Yes, the animal I am speaking of is a bear and their babies are called cubs. So, how are you doing? Are you getting most of these animals before I say them? If you are, you must be very smart. Nice job. The next animal. If you have been following this channel for a while, you will know that one of my neighbors had to kill one of these animals because it attacked his cat and had rabies. And I found out about that during one of my live streams. This animal is also known for killing chickens. And baby chickens are called chicks. And sometimes you might hear people refer to girls or ladies as chicks, but some people don't like that. They think it is demeaning or makes them feel like less of a person. But the animal you're trying to guess is not chicken. This animal kills chickens and is known as being sly. In fact, we have a saying in the United States that maybe he is as sly as a fox. And baby foxes are called kits. Not kittens like baby cats, simply 
kits. All right, the next animal, it hops. So it gets around by hopping. It lives mostly, no, it lives completely in Australia. You will not find this animal anywhere else on the planet native. You might see them in zoos, but they only naturally live in Australia. And the moms keep their babies in what we call pouches around their stomach. Yes, this animal is a kangaroo and their babies are called joeys. And yes, even the little baby girls, they are called joeys. When they grow up, the female kangaroos are called jills. This next animal also hops, but you will find this in the United States. You'll find it in Canada. I think you'll find it in Europe, not sure. But when it becomes winter, this animal will turn from gray to white. This animal is also known, at least in the United States, for eating carrots. Any ideas? It's a rabbit. And baby rabbits are called bunnies. And I'm not sure how often rabbits will eat carrots, but that became a popular idea when the cartoon Bugs Bunny came around. Bugs Bunny, it's a pretty old cartoon, but he used to eat a lot of carrots. Next animal. This animal mostly lives in the water, although in some parts of the world, you will see these animals living in trees. Many of this type of animal around me are slimy and green. Sometimes they are called toads by mistake, but that's a completely different animal. Yes, it's a frog and baby frogs are called either tadpoles or my favorite way to call baby frogs, pollywogs. When my brother and sister and I were young, we would go down to the river not far from our house and catch pollywogs. We would bring them back to our house in a bucket of water, wait for them to turn into little frogs and then release them back into that river. This next animal can be found on a farm. We might call this a working animal. I believe in the United States, it is illegal to eat this type of meat, but I know in different parts of the world, it is more common. You might see them pulling very heavy things. At one time, you may have seen this animal going into battle with a soldier on its back. In some large cities, you may see a police officer on this animal's back. Yes, of course, this is a horse. But baby horses have different names depending on its gender. Little boy horses, those are called colts. And little girl horses, they are called fillies. And this last one. You will find this animal on a farm. This animal is eaten quite a bit in this country as beef, but in India, where Mega is from, this animal is worshiped by some. This animal has milk that is very often drank by humans in the United States. Yes. It's a cow, or at least the females are cows. The guys, those are called bulls, and the babies are called calves. If you have only one, it's called a calf. Ends with an F. If you make it plural and have two calves, well, you can see how it's spelled right there. Just a little bonus, giraffes, tallest animal in the world, those babies are also called calves. That's it for this lesson, but if you want more English learning, there's a playlist right up there with my favorite videos. 
Below that is a playlist of all of the videos I have made this week. Please don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Hello and welcome back to another video. If this is your first time here, my name is Brent and I have been an English teacher in the United States for over 20 years. In today's video, I would like to teach you how to use could, would, and should. I know these words are not exactly easy to use, but if you stick until the end of the video, you will definitely have a better understanding. I also encourage you to re-watch this video a couple times. Let's talk about could first. It's almost like that word can. So could and can are very similar. Can means you are able to do it. I can speak English. I can breathe the air around me. I can go to the store. These are things that you are able to do. So think of can when you think of could. Could means you have the ability to do it. You can do it, but there might be a reason why you would not. And I will be talking about would in just a second. And remember, would is spelled like that. I could speak English, but my brain is a little tired. You know how when you're learning a new language and at the end of the day, it might be a little bit more difficult to speak that language than at the beginning of the day when your brain is fresh. I could go to the store to get food, but I don't feel like it. I think I will just order delivery. You could do it, but you just don't want to for some reason. Maybe your friend is moving apartments over the weekend and they are wondering, can you help me move? You might answer, yeah, I could. And that lets them know I have the ability, I have the time, but that just doesn't sound very fun to me. You're not being a very good friend, but I understand. You might say could because there is some doubt about your plans that weekend. Maybe you are busy. You will have to check with your schedule. And I'm not really happy with the lighting on this video, but in a couple weeks, I'll have some really nice lights so you won't see these shadows and stuff. Let's now talk about would. And that is often in the future. A lot like could, a lot like will. Let's talk about that friend moving. It's this weekend, it's coming up, it hasn't happened yet. You could say to that friend, I will help you, meaning there is no doubt about it, I will help you. But maybe there is a doubt. So you might say, oh, I would help you this weekend, but I have to work. Would and but often go together. I would love to help you move, but I don't want to. You probably shouldn't say that to your friend, right? One of my favorite examples to use is this party on Friday. And maybe you would like to go, but maybe you know after a long week of working and of course studying your English, you might be a little tired. I will go to your party, no doubt about it you will be there. I would go to your party, but I am going to be tired because I worked all week and I spent a lot of time studying English. So let's now talk about should. And I think it comes from shall, but we don't use shall that often in the United States. Should often talks about something in the future, but it also means like you it's hard not to use should or would and could in some of these definitions. We often use should when it is a good idea for us to do something, but maybe we don't want to. I should study my English tonight, meaning it's a good idea. You will get some benefit from studying, but maybe there are better things for you to do, or maybe your brain is just too tired. I should go to the store right now. I will definitely save some money, but it's raining out. So with should, there's always that condition of it's 
better if I do it, but maybe there's a reason why I don't want to do it. I should exercise more, but maybe I'm too lazy. I should eat better, but oh, cake tastes so good. I should wake up early, but my bed is so nice and warm. And for this video, I'm only focusing on the positive parts, but of course, you can use shouldn't, couldn't, wouldn't, and we often do, but I will save that for another video. You can also use could have, should have, would have, but again, I'll save most of that for another video. Amon and Nori, couple silver members, wanna give them a shout out. Thank you for becoming a member. I hope you learned a little something today. I hope you feel a little more comfortable with should, could, and would. There will be more videos on these three very difficult words. If you want some more English learning, there are a couple pretty cool playlists there for you. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.